Hello everyone and welcome back to Space Basics. In this video I'm going to be talking about the design of orbital rockets and we're going to talk about the general design of it and the constraints upon the orbital rockets, not the very detailed specifics of how tanks are designed or what kind of materials you want to use or how rockets control themselves. We're talking about the optimization of stages primarily. And we're going to be talking about getting off the ground, making sure that your rocket gets off the ground. That'll be object number one. But we are also not going to be talking about air-launched rockets or firework rockets or anything that isn't getting into orbit. So let's keep it down to the orbital rockets that will place something into space for an extended period of time. I have a little drawing pad uh, at my disposal this time, so my handwriting should be neater, but I'm going to have to get used to it a little bit. Uh, so keep that in mind. What we have in front of us is a one-ton payload, but we'll sort of set that aside for now. Uh, so it's just uh, one ton of aviation gas in a tank. Uh, that'll be our pay test payload. And what we want to do is talk about how to get off the ground first. So object number one is get up. Uh, see, I have to get used to this little thing. Get off the ground. But hopefully my handwriting will be nicer. So get off the ground. Uh, we are concerned with one quantity in relation to that, and that is thrust to weight ratio. And it's the equation for today, if you will, but it is a very simple one. Thrust to weight ratio, which we will abbreviate TWR, and you'll see this a lot. You will see TWR a lot. It is exactly what it says it is. It is the thrust of all your engines divided by the weight of your rocket. And if we expand that out, uh, again, thrust at the top, but the weight is the mass times the local gravity. Okay, in the previous videos we talked about how exhaust velocity is the specific impulse times 9.81, where 9.81 is just a term derived from Earth's surface gravity, but it isn't really to do with the gravity of the Earth, it's just a conversion factor. In this case, when we see 9.81, it'll really be Earth's surface gravity, and in different locations it will have to change. So for Earth, surface, not everywhere around Earth, is 9.81, or this, uh, it could be 9.80, something, 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 but we'll just go with 9.81. Uh, for the Moon, it's about 1.6. For the surface of Mars, it's about 3.4, and so forth. There'll be others. Now, Earth's number is sort of convenient because we can sort of round it off to 10, and I'll very often do that. And so, instead of having all of this, what we're going to do is we are going to take the thrust of our engine, whatever it is. So, instead of doing a whole bunch of stuff, we'll just take the thrust divided by the local gravity, which we'll pre pretend it's, is 10 and that will equal how much mass we can actually get off the ground. So basically to get off the ground we need a thrust weight ratio of 1. Must be 1. So the original equation is mass times local gravity down here and we need it to be uh, greater than 1. Greater than 1. <laughs> okay, greater than 1, not equal to, we want it greater than 1. And then when we move mass over here, we get an equation thrust divided by local gravity is greater than mass. Okay, so, and in this case we're going to be talking about local gravity as 10 to round off Earth's gravity. So that's the absolute minimum. If you don't have that, you're definitely not getting off the ground. Uh, there's also atmospheric drag and all that business. I have this engine here, and this is a generic engine I made so that we don't get hung up on existing engine design, uh, rocket designs. So this is not an engine that exists in real life, but it could. It is theoretically possible, its, and, uh, its numbers are reasonable. Uh, so we have some numbers associated with it. We have the thrust in vacuum. We are not interested in that as far as getting off the ground. That's important for our ultimate delta V calculations and getting into orbit because we don't spend a whole lot of time on the ground at sea level, but we're going to set that aside for now. 
Uh, here, the sea level thrust is 613.5 kilonewtons, so thereabouts. And so in our equation, we're going to put that at the top. So that means that this engine here, 613.5, and then we just divide it by 10. So that's the same as moving the decimal point over to the left by one. So it's 61.35. And so 600, uh, uh, 61.35 tons. Okay, and here on units, if the thrust is in kilonewtons, kilonewtons, and you divide by 10, you get tons. If the thrust is in newtons, you get kilograms. Okay, so it's metric tons. So that's the most that this engine on its own can lift off the ground, 61 tons. So it can easily lift this payload, but then we don't have any fuel for it. So the question is, with this one engine, can we pack enough fuel to lift this uh, little payload off the ground? We can lift off with a 61 ton rocket at most off the ground. Now, also there's the question, is this the right engine? Is this a good engine to begin with? And so let's take a look at some of our engine choices. Why did I pick this engine instead of some other one? Let me uh, clear this off. So remember, thrust weight ratio is a fairly simple thing. And for now, we're going to use the approximation that we just take the thrusts that we see and divide it by 10. And that'll tell us whether uh, what mass it can get off the ground from Earth. So fairly simple. And if we take a look at uh, some of these engines, uh, this one has a sea level thrust of 155 kilonewtons, so weaker than this one. And, but it's got a huge gap between the vacuum and sea level thrust. Well, that means that this is a vacuum optimized engine. Uh, if there's a big gap, then the engine is more suited to be an upper stage engine. If there is a small gap, like with the engine that we have out here right now, see uh, it's 709 versus 613, well that's a fairly small gap between them. Uh, that means that it is okay for use on the surface. and. Here, the specific impulse, which is our efficiency, is very close together. So it gets 294 at sea level, 341 in vacuum. Our This vacuum optimized engine gets less at sea, sea level, but way more in vacuum. And that's also because it's using a different set of propellants. Okay, so when we're looking at our engine list, we will see these uh, thrust numbers and we can pick out which ones are good for sea level and which ones aren't. And this one is very bad for sea level. Uh, that would not do much. That's 7.8 tons of thrust at sea level and 36 tons of thrust in vacuum. So much more in vacuum than at sea level. Again, all we're doing is moving the decimal point over. And this one is a good sea level engine. It's 79 uh, tons of thrust at sea level, 91 tons in vacuum. So very close to each other. Uh, so that can be used. and. Yeah, so that's how we look at them. So we can sort them out in terms of which ones should be going on a first stage and which ones should be going on a second stage. But our first stage engine will require more thrust than our second stage engine because our second stage engine is going to be lifting less. All the fuel that we needed for the first stage will be gone. So we <laughs> do not put a more powerful engine on your second stage, please. Uh, so. What, what is the ratio? How is this engine good enough for this rocket? Well, let's do an, uh, talk about another approximation. So the thrust weight ratio is the only strict equation that I plan to introduce. What we're going to talk about is some approximations based on what uh, specific impulse and what propellant uh, we have. We can sort of estimate, we can, can sort of estimate uh, how much of the rocket we can get to orbit. Solid fuel. We haven't talked much about solid fuel, but it's that's because it's fairly low efficiency. And for solid fueled rockets, the minimum you should be getting is about 2% of the rocket into orbit. So uh, working backwards, that means that whatever your payload is, you're going to need 50 times that. So for the one ton payload, you'll need a 50 ton rocket. That's the first approximation uh, that you can refine that. Now, if your rocket is super small, uh, then you're going to hit upon some other inefficiencies because if, as you reduce the volume, uh, you still have a lot of surface area. The scaling down doesn't work well with rockets in general. Uh, there's sort of a sweet spot where you scale up 
and you're just increasing the mass by the surface area of the rocket, which is a square, but you're getting a cube of uh, uh, increasing the volume by a cube. So you can sort of scale up and get more efficient like that. Uh, to a point where your material can no longer sustain that and then you have to get make the walls thicker. So making small rockets is generally inefficient. Uh, so keep that in mind. But uh, solid. And then there's the class of hypergolic fuels. And these uh, we talked very, very briefly about previously, but they're the ones that combust uh, instantaneously with each other. There's a whole bunch of them. Most of them uh, involves some variant of hydrazine, uh, but hypergolic fuels and also kerosene and oxygen is very close to the hypergolic fuels, just a little bit better. So there's the kerosene fuel oxygen oxidizer, and this is basically 3% is the minimum you're looking for, or the whole rocket is going to end up being uh, 33 times the payload. So we're looking for a 33 ton rocket. And then there's methane. And oxygen it might be a 3.5 percent or 28 times or 28 tons per ton of payload and then uh, hydrogen and oxygen now your stages might be different things though and hydrogen and oxygen we'd be expecting 4 percent or the if you're using that for the entire rocket uh, the rock would be 25 tons per ton of payload. But your stages can be different things. For instance, hydrogen and oxygen engines uh, would require really large tanks. The hydrogen tank, because hydrogen is not very dense, you're going to have to make the tank really big, and that increases the structural mass. So a lot of the times, you won't want to have that be your first stage, because the first stage is going to be a very big tank, and the second stage is a smaller tank. Uh, so you... As to avoid having the first stage be a huge hydrogen tank, we tend to see that the first stage is one of these, and maybe with some solids slapped to the side, and the upper stage will be the hydrogen-oxygen stage. So that happens a lot. Uh, but uh, to be more refined than these percentages, another way of estimating it is to take a look at the specific impulse of the particular engine. So it is, these are just rules of thumb. They're not like super rigid or anything like that. I would take a look at the, the specific impulse here and just estimate it based on that. Just divide this number by 100, which means moving the decimal point two spaces. And I'd say like uh, this could get 3.4% of uh, the total rocket mass into orbit. Okay, and so again, that's just a rule of thumb estimate. And... If this was a sea level engine, it would be better, but this one could get 4.5%. So something like that. Again, there's hydrogen, oxygen, that's why it's so good. But let's build out the rocket. So what, what we've determined here is that uh, this particular engine, with its 60 uh, tons of thrust, we said 61 tons, uh, should be enough, right? Uh, this one is a uh, methane-oxygen engine, actually, and uh, we don't expect it to be very heavy. So let's build out the rocket and see what we've got here. Now we need a second stage. Well, let's say we just had one stage, single stage to orbit. So you'll hear this term single stage to orbit. So SSTO is single stage to orbit. Single stage to orbit has not been done. Uh, and the reason it's not been done is because it's not a very efficient way to deliver your payload. Uh, for any given payload, the most optimal rocket, unless you're trying to recover the rocket, is a two-stage rocket, or maybe even a three-stage rocket. But um, the reason people like to talk about SSD or single stage to orbit is if they can get the single stage back, if they can reuse it. And so far that has not been done. Uh, so, but trying to, remember in the previous videos we talked about how you get diminishing returns for each new ton you put into a stage. Well, if you have only one stage, you really have to make that stage really huge to get a relatively small amount of payload to orbit. 
uh, we talked about the 2%, 3%, 4%, and all that. A single stage to orbit system would be lucky to get 1% uh, of its mass into orbit. So, well, well, let's just see that here with this. Now, of course, this is a sea level optimized engine, so it's not perfect. But let's build it out here. And of course, if you're trying to recover the rocket, it's going to be even worse because you have to have all the equipment, like wings, uh, to recover the rocket. But we're using Kerbal Space Program because it allows us to very quickly mock up our our intended rockets and examine how efficient they are. So that is a fairing. That is to protect it from aerodynamics. We'll talk about aerodynamic drag and gravity losses in a second. We are just talking about the generalities here. Uh, we need some sort of control unit. So this is a Delta Avionics package. So this it is our computer controlling the rocket. And the computer controlling the rocket will also give us, because I have many mods, it'll also give us the opportunity to get numbers on the efficiency of the rocket and how much Delta V we have. Delta V, we need 9,500 meters per second to make orbit will be our first approximation. Uh, for a Kerbal Space Program, uh, the, what I'm doing right now is more complicated. I'm not discussing how to play the game. Uh, so we're, we're going to set that aside for now. Uh, we will set aside all the details of what I'm doing. Um, the game does have a display for the delta V of the rocket here. And what we want to make sure is it's in vacuum. Because most of the time while we launch, we'll be in vacuum. So we're mo mostly interested in the vacuum number, not the sea level number. And we are trying to get, if we want a single stage to orbit, 9,500 meters per second. Now this is getting a little bit long here, but we'll just keep it as it is. This is looking more like a model rocket. There's a reason why you don't get long, long tanks like this with real rockets. And that is because of vibrations and the stress on the tank when it's a really long, thin tube. So you can see every time I change it, oh, now it's having real fun. Okay, every time I increase the size of the tank, I don't know why it went down there, but it only adds a little bit more now, like 20 meters per second. It's in fact uh, getting impossible to make this into a rocket that can get 9,500. But this actually probably is enough. The problem is our thrust weight ratio is too low. Remember, we can only carry 61 tons. This is 75 tons right now. But it's not too bad uh, if the engine had enough thrust. This is about a 1% SSTO, single stage to orbit system. So you can see, I mean, is, is the single stage to orbit system possible? Sure, but it, it's just not very optimal. And in this case, our engine would not be enough. And we calculated that our engine should be able to make a nice rocket that can get one, one ton to orbit. So let's work with that. So we want a second stage. And we are going to put that second stage here. But we have to choose an engine. Now this time we want a vacuum engine, not a sea level engine. And what is the relationship between the engine on the first stage and the second stage? Uh, to, uh, again, we're going to be going rules of thumb here. But it really depends on what kind of engine you pick and what fuel it uses. But let's just say the same propellant. And in that case, uh, something that has one-fifth of the thrust of the core engine is fine. But one of the constraints you're going to have in real life, and also in games like Kerbal Space Program, is that you don't always get the engine that you want. <laughs> so uh, we can say, oh, we want one-fifth. And there are mathematical reasons for wanting one-fifth. Uh, so we're looking for a thrust of 140 kilonewtons. But that, that's just a roundabout rule of thumb thing anyway. And what we can do is, this is also a methane oxygen engine, like the first stage. And if we put two of these on, that'll be 140 kilonewtons. But then comes the second constraint, which is cost. And a lot of times people don't build optimal rockets because building the optimal rocket, the one that will be weighed the least on the pad, is going to cost more. 
right? It might be that you need more engines if you're going to try and get a rocket that weighs less on the pad. So instead, they'll just put the one engine and they'll accept the fact that they're going to have a slightly less than efficient rocket. Now, if we put the two stages together, and now in order to put the two stages together, we need a decoupling system, something that is explosive, generally speaking, that will separate the two. Now on Falcon 9, the SpaceX rocket, uh, that does not use an explosive system uh, as such. It uses a hydraulic system. But generally speaking, we're talking about something explosive just to make sure that they separate. And we're looking for an interstage. So there's something between the stages that will successfully separate them. And let me tell you, uh, a lot of rocket mishaps occur when trying to separate the stages, which is one reason why, even though sometimes it might be optimal to do so, you don't see three-stage rockets, because that's just something else that can go wrong. But we'll quickly see why we want two stages. Okay, and we need to make sure that our engines are in the right place in the staging. So, now we have a rocket that well, we have too much on the upper stage and too little on the lower stage. So let's try and rationalize that a little bit. We need 9,000, uh, sorry, 9,500, yeah. Uh, so that is our rule of thumb number right now. We'll talk more about that in a sec. Okay, we've reached our rule of thumb number with uh, 34 tons. We can actually lessen this because our thrust to weight ratio, this number right here, and, and in stock, you will see the number here instead. So we'll just uh, use the numbers that we have in the corner here. We see the 9,556 there. And at sea level, we have a thrust to weight ratio, remember that TWR, of 1.85. Anything above one is going to lift off the ground, but you're also fighting against atmospheric drag, so you really want to be above 1.2, 1.3. And it'll do the calculation for you there. Uh, one thing you'll notice that is that in the on the vacuum number, we're getting a whole lot more from the second stage than we are on the first stage. But is that a good thing or a bad thing? The rule of thumb here is that the amount that you get from the second stage should, should be proportional to the efficiency of it compared to the first stage. So the first stage is 341. The second stage in vacuum has an efficiency of 367. That's not a whole lot more. So the stages should be roughly equal if we're talking about being efficient. Let's see if that really does give us a more efficient rocket. So it's getting a little bit long, so I'm going to make the first stage wider as well. And we can do that by widening the base of our interest stage. Well, here the upper stage is just a little bit more than the lower stage. It's a little bit heavier, it looks like. But on the flip side, we get a much higher thrust to weight ratio with the first stage for a longer period of time. And if you recall, the upper stage was getting a very low thrust to weight ratio when it was bigger. Uh, right now, it has a thrust to weight ratio of 1 in vacuum. This is the vacuum number. Let's actually go to the stock numbers. Uh, it's just easier to see with MechJeb for me because it's got all the numbers laid out uh, horizontally. But in the vacuum, uh, we have 1.01 thrust to weight ratio. Do we need 1.01 with the upper stage? No, not technically because the upper stage, all it needs, it's going to be horizontal at that point. If you recall from the first video, the first stage is going to be doing all the fighting against gravity and the atmosphere and all that. By the time we get to the second stage, we're going to be going horizontal as much as possible. But it needs to be able to have enough acceleration so that it can get to orbit in the time that it has before it falls back down. So a thrust to weight ratio of 1 is nice to have. Uh, it'll somewhat ensure this, but you can have less. And the less work that the upper stage has to do, the less you can have the thrust to weight ratio. So if it's a very short duration upper stage or the first stage does most of the work, you can have that be less. Uh, there are other reasons why, but we'll get to, into that later. Okay, so we have a pretty high thrust to weight ratio off the start. And this rocket, I would expect, we can easily reduce how much delta V we need. So this is the second topic. Um, somebody had asked, 
how you can reduce how much delta V is necessary to get to orbit. We've been using this rule of thumb 9,500, but let's talk about the bare minimum here. So I've said 9,500 is my benchmark. That's what I normally pack. Uh, however, at the very, very bare minimum to make orbit is 7,400 meters per second. Now, if you, the orbital velocity is 7,800, so how can we do it with 7,400? Well, uh, um, we can do it with 7,400 because there's also the rotation of the Earth uh, to take advantage of. So if you're launching from the surface at uh, the equator, actually if you launch from a slightly higher above the surface, actually the very best would be if you make a tower. <laughs> if you make a tower that is 200 kilometers high, hoist the rocket to the top of it, and then fire it away and make sure that the rocket goes really fast really soon then you could make it in much better time uh, in fact so that rocket that you hoisted to the top of the tower would require only 7400 but that is not practical we cannot make 200 kilometer towers right now so this number is just theoretical that's the minimum but there's a big gap between uh, the number that I go with and the bare minimum that you would need with the tall tower and the really high thrust rocket. And you can reduce it by having a higher thrust to weight ratio rocket, which means that it passes through the atmosphere quicker and experiences less gravity losses. So more thrust to weight ratio means that you need less delta V. And if we have 1.76, let's just launch this rocket and we are going to see how much delta V it has left over, right? We have 9,500 in here. Let's see how much it has left over, and then we'll be able to see how little we needed with 1.76, which is a fairly good number. But in this game, we are not experiencing some of the downsides of having this thrust weight ratio. What are the downsides? Well, one, stress. Uh, you are putting the vehicle under more stress, so you're going to need to strengthen the tanks in order to bear this high thrust. Uh, so one reason why you don't see this high thrust weight ratio with over the launch rockets, even though you could reduce the amount of delta V that you need to get to orbit, is because you're going to make the tanks heavier, right? The, the mass of the tanks is directly related to how much stress the tanks are going to experience, and that is related to how much thrust to weight ratio the rocket has and how much buffeting and also uh, winds and a whole bunch of other factors that don't occur in Kerbal Space Program. So it's one of those things that uh, we need to worry about. And another thing is that at high thrust to weight ratios, you want the rocket to minimize its aerodynamic drag. So it has to be sleek, right? It has to be a thin rocket, thin rocket. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be accelerating so fast. Drag, you don't have to remember this equation, uh, but drag is one half. It's one half a drag coefficient, which relates to the shape of the thing, the shape of the cross section. Oh, uh, yeah, just the shape of the thing. So the drag coefficient is the shape of the thing. If you're a blunt object, you're going to have a high drag coefficient. If you are a streamlined object, you have a low one. The density of the atmosphere, which is rho. Okay, it did that to me again. Okay, rho, not p, it's rho. The area hitting the atmosphere, so that'll be the cross-sectional area, that's um, sort of the, the circle here, and then the velocity squared. So what we're concerned with is the bit that's getting squared here. If you have a very high thrust to weight ratio, you're going to end up going faster in a thicker part of the atmosphere. <laughs> you got a thicker, uh, thing there. Uh, that wasn't my intention, but I guess it makes the point. So yes, when you're lower in the atmosphere, you're going to be going faster. And when you're low in the at lower in the atmosphere, that number is going to be higher. And you're making this number higher when that number is higher. So the way to counteract that is to, and generally speaking, the drag coefficient for rockets are going to be as low as they can be. So that leaves only one number that you can reduce to limit how much aerodynamic drag you have, and that's the area. So this area. So just spelling it out, the things that go into aerodynamic drag, uh, 
The things that go into it are the shape, that's the drag coefficient, the air density, the area that is hitting the atmosphere, so the cross-sectional area, and then the velocity squared. But no, squared. That squared is going to catch up to you really quickly. So if you want to reduce how much you lose to the atmosphere, that actually is the opposite of trying to get through with few, less gravity losses uh, by increasing the thrust to weight ratio. So the increasing the thrust to weight ratio is most effective at reducing the gravity loss because you're fighting against gravity initially, but you're going to experience more atmospheric drag, which requires you to make a thinner rocket. What's the problem with a thinner rocket? Why don't we just make a thinner rocket? You can't fit the payload on top, <laughs> actually. The problem is the payload. So you'll see rockets are fatter because they need to accommodate larger payloads. If you make too thin a rocket, you can't have the bigger payload, the bigger satellites that you need to launch. So that is our constraint there. We need to be able to fit the payload on top. And given that, we have a minimum area to accommodate that. And so as a result, a lot of rockets, they do not try to have such a high thrust to weight ratio as 1.76. Uh, so they'll tend to have 1.3 to 1.4, sometimes 1.5. Okay, so that'll be a little bit happier for them. So that's a good number to aim for. Don't go too much lower than that. Uh, the Saturn V uh, was expecting upgrades to its engines. Initially, it was at 1.15, but ultimately, I think they got to 1.3 or something like that. So you can improve the engines uh, and then uh, leave room for that. Uh, the Saturn V rose very, very slowly indeed. That's fairly unusual, but... It was also a very well-optimized rocket, so that helped. Anyway, let's launch this sucker and see how much we have left over after we get to orbit. And let's clear that up and have some launch clamps. That's helpful for not sitting on the bottom of the engine on the ground. We want the launch clamps to release after the engine starts. Engines, in general, take some time to spool up. They do not immediately get to full thrust. So you'll see a rocket once it's lit its engines, sit on the pad for a while. As and they take that opportunity to check out if the engines are working properly. As far as the fairings around the the payload are concerned, you see we just got a little bit more because I rearranged things. Um, so actually let's keep things consistent. I want that 9,500. I don't want to um, have too much more than that. So I'll make the rocket even smaller now that it seems like we're getting more after I rearrange things. Okay, so we're at 1.82 and this is a little bit better. Okay, so we'll leave it there. But the fairings are generally released when we get a low thrust weight ratio. So usually it's right after the first stage ends where we'll have a minimum uh, thrust weight ratio, minimum stress on the vehicle uh, after uh, we've released the first stage, so that's a good time to get rid of the fairings. Well, we're experiencing some curbliness here right now. I don't know what's up, but we'll try and launch. I don't know what the 1.1 meters per second is from. And that bodes ill for this rocket right now. Ignition. So there's just a straight methane oxygen rocket with a lot of thrust to weight ratio. Well, it looks like it's going fine right now. And if you have a rocket that has a high thrust to weight ratio like this, it needs to turn more aggressively than one that does not. Right now, we have no roll control. Remember, I set aside the whole issue of how to control the rocket. <laughs> um, right now, we have yaw and pitch control, thanks to the engine turning. But because we only have one engine, it can't control roll. We'll get to that later. <laughs> like I said. So we're already past the speed of sound. This is where the vehicle will be in the highest stress, highest dynamic pressure. We're going steeper than I would like. It's simply because I don't want the vehicle to break apart. Right about now, I would like to be at 45 degrees, actually. But we also have to watch whether we're maxing out our um, controls, which we aren't. So that's good. 
Let me see if I can force it down a little bit more. It's better to follow the prograde vector or the vector of your existing velocity. If you're deviating from that, not only does that put more stress on the vehicle, but it is also less efficient. The gap between the prograde vector and the way you're pointing is all inefficiency. But sometimes we have to force it, especially with the high thrust rockets. You have to be careful not to let them take too long. Note that our apoapsis is already well above the line that delineates space. So we already have a space like apoapsis, and the amount of time to apoapsis, 2 minutes and 30 seconds, uh, should be more than enough for a 4 minute stage to deal with. Uh, we, you can double that and see. So this is our little vacuum engine, which ended up being one tenth the thrust of the stage before it. And we can separate fairings now. We are in uh, nominal space, 100 uh, kilometers. And we are still spinning. I'll keep it to this small. This is the surface velocity. We're expecting 7,400 meters per second on there in order to reach orbit, because that does not include the rotation of the Earth. So again, a double the time to apoapsis to see if you have enough time. One way you can tell whether you're looking good or not is to take the surface velocity, add the delta V here, and since we're not experiencing any gravity loss or atmospheric drag anymore, uh, as long as that is above 7,400, remember we can attack on another 400 uh, based on the rotation of the Earth, uh, as long as that's above 7,400 we should be okay. But I'd say that I took a very inefficient launch trajectory, and so that's caused us some problems. We're not as efficient, and we're not going to end up with as much delta V. For some reason, the burn time that indicates in the corner here is just not correct. I don't know why. So that number isn't right. The other numbers are correct. And again, we want to sort of hang out at our peak here. We've reached our peak. And we'll tilt up a little bit to sort of stay here. And we're waiting for the periapsis in the bottom right-hand corner there to be above 140 at the very least. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Camera's spinned around a whole lot, but we are in orbit, proper orbit. And our orbital velocity is 7,815, so that is proper. And we have 270 meters per second left. So the actual amount of delta V that we needed to get the payload into orbit was actually more like 9,300, not 9,500. And that's largely thanks to the high thrust to weight ratio of the rocket. So, and we could have probably gotten better than that. We could got, uh, we probably could have gotten it down to 9,100 if I had a very efficient launch. So, but do we really want to reduce the amount of delta V that it takes to get to orbit? Do we want it to take only 9,100? It might be better if we have these engines, given that we're paying for these engines as it is, uh, to have a bigger payload, right? Instead of trying to uh, reduce how much delta V it gets to or uh, it takes to get to orbit. Why don't we increase the payload and then we can carry something heavier to orbit? So let's say we go for uh, 1.5 tons. Will that work out for us? Can we make this rocket get 1.5 tons and still take uh, right now? We only have 8,700 meters per second, but we're going to reduce the thrust weight ratio by increasing more fuel in the rocket. Okay. And then by increasing the fuel in the rocket, we'll have, we'll take more delta V to get to orbit because our thrust weight ratio is lower because we're going to be fighting against gravity for longer. But we will get a larger payload into orbit. So we can make this bigger and make this bigger. Uh, so now we're pretty close to 9,500. We're still a decent thrust weight ratio off the ground. And I think the game will agree here too. 1.4. Like I said, 1.3 to 1.4 is pretty normal. And one consideration, if you have a lot of engines, then you might want to make it so that it survives the loss of an engine. But since we only have one engine, that's moot. Uh, 
Um, so we could uh, squeeze a little bit more out of the upper stage. Remember, the upper stage doesn't, strictly speaking, need a thrust to weight ratio of one. Uh, that's not necessary because it's already going horizontal at the time. All it needs is enough time in order to do a burn, and we seem to be fairly comfortable with that on the previous launch. Uh, 0.8 is fine. That's the vacuum number. Uh, you might be fooled by taking a look at the sea level thrust weight ratio, but at that point it's in vacuum. So we need to make sure that we're looking at the vacuum thrust weight ratio, and that is 0.82, which should be okay. And so we uh, make sure it has, remember the upper stage is a little bit more efficient than the lower stage, so we want it to have a little bit more delta V to be optimal. And we see that we can get to 9,500, let's say, we'll, let's just hit it directly. And now we're carrying 1.5 tons to orbit. So we've increased our payload capacity by 50%. And if we go with, go with the ratio, remember I talked about percentages of how a methane oxygen rocket can do. 1.5 divided by 44.094. Right now we are at 3.4%. So we could probably eke out a little bit more. I think for methane oxygen, I had said 3.5%. Right now we're at 3.4%. Part of that is because we we're a fairly small rocket and small rockets tend to be less efficient, but uh, we could probably eke out a little bit more and get to that 3.5% that we're supposed to. Okay, so again, optimizing for how little delta V you use to get to orbit isn't necessarily the goal. <laughs> you, could, you could do that by making sure that your thrust weight ratio is high, but then you're probably not putting as much of a payload into orbit as your rocket is capable of. So what you want to optimize for is how much payload you get into orbit. And yeah, so here we've done a little bit of a better job than on the first launch for doing that. This will still work out just fine. And the other principles are make sure you get off the ground and your stages should be proportional to how much delta V uh, how much specific impulse they have. So this one is a little bit more efficient than the first stage, so make sure it provides a little bit more delta V. Um, and again, even if you don't have this MechJeb dialog, you can see that with these numbers here, as long as you make sure it's vacuum. Otherwise, if you use sea level, then, uh, well, it's not gonna stay at sea level for very long. All right, so with all that, and I'm sure there'll be discussion, there's a lot more that can be discussed with this but those are the basics and with that i'll say thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed this video if you did please do press like if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below and i'll see you next time